to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To his disciples, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. We welcome you today to our study of Answering Denominational Doctrines. Today we're going to be considering various doctrines and teachings of the Baptist Church to see whether they are true according to the Bible. And so as always, we want to encourage you to have your Bible handy as we're going to look to the Word of God today as the final authority on all matters. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, on Sunday or Wednesday, they'd be happy to have you as a guest. And friend, if you've got a Bible question, you'd like to study the Scriptures further, they'd be more than happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. Friend, we also want to help you in your study of God's Word here at The Gospel of Christ. Take a moment and visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our previous videos and audio lessons. We've got written material. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lessons or any of our lessons, they're free of charge. We'll be glad to send that to you free of charge as well. You can contact us, write us, or call us, and we'd be glad to help you with that. And with the way smartphones and technology is going today, we want to encourage you to download the Gospel of Christ app for both Android and Apple from the Play Store and the Apple Store. And there's great information there as well. Friend, today we're thinking about God's truth as it relates to certain teachings of men. And as we today discuss various doctrines of the Baptist Church, I want you to understand some things from the outset real clearly. I have friends who are members of the Baptist Church. I know other people who are as well. They're good people. They're kind people. They are sincere people. They have a, a zeal for God and they're concerned about uh, God and, and things of religious nature. And so we have no qualm. We have no problem. Uh, we're not out to get anybody in that sense. But friend, as we think about what doctrine of the Baptist Church may say and compare that with the Bible, our only motive is to please God, to put God's Word out in the front, and to help men and women see what is truth. As we began the lesson with, Jesus said, the truth is what makes men free. And today we're concerned about God's truth versus the teaching of men because God's truth is the only thing that will save. Let's begin by thinking about some of the doctrines that the Baptist Church, and when we say the Baptist Church might teach this, I know there may be small factions among that that would not, but as a general rule, the majority of would believe and follow these things, and we'll show sources and documentation from that as well. What is the first doctrine of the Baptist Church that we'd like to examine today? The first doctrine involves the Baptist teaching about baptism. Now friend, we want to quote to you from the Standard Manual for Baptist Churches by Edward Hiscox. Have a copy of that from our library today. And this is basically a reference for Baptist churches. has been out for a long time and it is a standard in many ways. And here's what the Baptist Standard Baptist Manual uh, for Baptist Churches says about baptism. In the chapter entitled Church Ordinances, on page 20 and 21, under note number 8, it says this, Baptism is not essential to salvation. 
For our churches utterly repudiate the dogma of baptismal regeneration, but it is essential to obedience since Christ has commanded it. Now, Edward Hiscox and the Standard Baptist Manual and the majority of Baptist churches and Baptist preachers will acknowledge they do not believe nor do they teach that baptism is essential to salvation. Now, friend, in our study today, what we want to do is examine those doctrines like that with the Bible. And friend, this is one where the Bible is so clear you need help to misunderstand it. The Baptist Church says baptism is not essential to salvation. Well, let's ask the question, what does the Bible say? Jeremiah 37 verse 17 asks, is there any word from the Lord? Romans 4 verse 3, what does the Scripture say? And really, what does the Lord say on this subject? Well, friend, there are a host of passages which clearly contradict what the Baptist doctrine teaches. Here are some of those. In Mark chapter 16, verse number 16, Jesus has given the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature, and here's what Jesus says about converting people to the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Now friend, if you don't believe, you're not even a candidate to be baptized. But what did Jesus say about what a person must do to be saved? Did Jesus say, he who believes will be saved? That's not all he said. Did Jesus say, he who is baptized will be saved? No, that's not what he said. Jesus clearly said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now friend, Jesus said you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved. That means both belief and baptism are essential to salvation. But sometimes people like to talk about Mark 16, 16 and try to throw that out, although there is a host of evidence for that. But there are multiple other passages which teach this same truth. Think about these passages. John chapter 3, verse number 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's an if and only if statement. That's an ultimatum. There is no exception to that idea. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter God's kingdom. Being in God's kingdom is essential because Jesus is coming back to receive to heaven those that are in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 26. And so again, the idea of it being essential is clearly taught there. But listen to this passage. When the first gospel sermon is preached, in Acts chapter 2, Peter brings it to a climax and says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says, They were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What did Peter say they needed to do? Friend, Peter did not say, just say the sinner's prayer. Just believe in your heart. Just uh, acknowledge Jesus as Lord. What did Peter say? What does the Holy Spirit indicate is necessary for salvation there? In Acts 2 verse 38, the apostle Peter by inspiration of the Holy Spirit said this, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now friend, I don't want you to miss this idea. This passage clearly teaches baptism is essential to salvation because it is at the point when we obey the gospel in the culminating act of baptism that our sins are washed away. That's what Peter said. Now think about this for a moment. What is it that separates me from God? Well, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 clearly says, Our sins separate us 
from a holy and loving God. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3, verse 23. And so here we have man, here we have God. There is a barrier between man and God. What is that barrier? Sin is what's separating man from God. Friend, what is it that washes away, removes sin? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The Bible clearly teaches baptism is essential to salvation. I want you to think about what Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts chapter 22 verse 16. Now, to kind of set the stage, in Acts chapter 9, the Lord spoke to Saul and he told him, I want you to go in the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Saul is recounting, Paul is recounting that conversion and in Acts 22 verse 16, God's servant Ananias comes to Saul and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized, listen to this now, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, as we've noted, sin's what separates a man from God. Sin is what's going to cause men to be lost if at the point of baptism our sins are washed away. Then friend, baptism is essential to salvation. Now someone says, well, are you saying there's something mystical or magical? In the no, that's not the idea. Just like believing, just like repenting, just like making the good confession, baptism is simply a command of God. God's told us to do it. It's His requirement. There's nothing mystical or magical in the water except that we have obeyed God and in the mind of God, God knows and recognizes that. Here's probably though the clearest passage which so clearly contradicts in the opposite language of the Baptist Standard Baptist Manual uh, that there is available. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Now friend, I want you to compare these two with an openest and honest heart. Standard Baptist Manual, note number 8, page number 22 says, Baptism is not essential to salvation. The Holy Spirit says in 1 Peter 3, 21, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, that's not our words. That's God's word. Baptism is not essential to salvation. Peter said by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, baptism does now also save us. And so what this really comes down to is, whose word am I going to accept? Who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe the Baptist standard, standard Manual, Baptist preachers, and people like Billy Graham, or am I going to just simply accept what the New Testament says and obey that? My friend, we know this to be true and important because Romans 6, 1 through 4 teaches us when we're buried with Christ in baptism, we contact His death. It's the, listen carefully now, it is the death sacrifice and atoning blood of Jesus that saves. Don't miss this point. It's the blood of Christ that saves. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sins. It's His death, sacrifice, and blood that saves us. But when does the Bible say we contact that blood? Romans 6, 1 through 4 tells us when we're buried with Christ in baptism, that's when we contact His sacrifice, His death, and His blood. All right then, let's think about another doctrine that we want to compare the Baptist Church, Baptist doctrine, with the doctrine of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's one that I think you'll find very interesting as it relates to church membership. Baptists believe that to become a member of a Baptist church, their church, you must be voted in. And again, there would be some who wouldn't believe this, some who don't say this, but as a standard, many Baptist churches believe that you must be voted in to the Baptist church. Let me read to you from again the Standard Manual for Baptist Churches by Edward Hiscox on page number 22 about church membership. Here's what it says. It is most likely that in the apostolic age when there was but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism and no differing denominations existed, the baptism of a convert by that very act 
constituted him a member of the church and at once endowed him with all the rights and privileges of full membership. In that sense, baptism was the door into the church. Well, that, that's pretty clear and telling, but listen to this now. He says this, now it is different. Well, my first question is why, but listen on. Now it is different. And while the churches are desirous of receiving members, they are wary and cautious that they do not receive unworthy persons. The churches, therefore, have candidates come before them, make their statement, give their experience, and then their reception is decided by a vote of the members. Friend, that statement is so telling. Listen to this. He says, during the New Testament age, when there was only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and no denominations existed, people were added to the church simply by obeying the gospel, culminating in baptism. Friend, my first question is, why do we have to have all that? Why do we have to have the denominational chaos, confusion, dogma, and doctrine? If we've got the Word of God, which is everything we need for life and godliness, if it is the Word of God that saves, and friend, we don't need all the rest of that denominational doctrine and confusion. Why, here's, friend, here's all we're asking today. Why can't we simply go back to the New Testament age, be, be what they were in the first century, put away all denominational teaching, and just be Christians? Just do what they did and be what they were, Christians and nothing more. But friend, as you think about this idea, it, com the problem is compounded by the fact, number one, that there is no scriptural authority for voting anybody into the church. Listen real carefully to me now. I've got no power, you've got no power, and no one anywhere else has the power given by God to vote on and decide who is or who is not going to become a member. How do we make that determination? Well, God decides when people obey the gospel. Here's the pattern for how one becomes a member of the church. In Acts chapter 2, they preach the gospel. Many women heard people, heard Peter say what to do. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. In that context, the Bible says, those who gladly received His word were baptized. And I want you to listen to verse 47. How does a person become a member of the Lord's church? Baptist church says, we need to vote them in. What does the Bible say? And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Friend, do you see the stark contrast? Men vote them in when they obey the gospel. God adds them to the church. Friend, when you obey the gospel and you do what the Bible says to become a Christian, you are a member of the Lord's church anywhere you go worldwide. Because you've done what God says, and God is the one who makes that decision. But think about how this problem, God's advice is always best, and we know that. His teaching's always best. But think about how this problem could be compounded. What if somebody or a group of somebodies in that particular Baptist church has a grudge or an axe to grind against somebody? And out of prejudice and bias, because they don't like that person, they say, you know, I'm voting no. Well, friend, that's not God's will. And you can see how the, com the problem might be compounded by prejudice and pride and social status or how much money you have or don't have. There's just a whole laundry list of problems that could come into effect because of that. And so we see the Baptist doctrine is in conflict with the New Testament teaching on baptism. It's in conflict, clearly in conflict, with what the Lord teaches about how one becomes a member of the church but then there's another area to consider also. What does the Baptist church teach concerning the taking of the Lord's Supper? Let's consider that for just a moment. Concerning the Lord's Supper, as we read again from the Standard Baptist Manual, I want you to hear what they say about the, the frequency, regularity, or what God has dictated concerning this. Page number 20, note number 5, they say this about the Lord's Supper. As to the time place 
and frequency of the ordinance, talking about the Lord's Supper, no scriptural directions are given. These are left optional within the churches. They are usually observed on Sundays, but not necessarily. As to the supper, our churches have very generally come to observe it on the first Sunday of each month. And so basically, God didn't, didn't give any directions. You can take it on Sunday if you want. You can take it once a month. You can take it once a week, whatever. God didn't make any decision on that, and that is completely left up to you or to each congregation. Well, friend, is that really true? Did God not give any direction at all concerning the partaking of the Lord's Supper? A well, friend, by apostolic example, God did authorize His church on the when and the where and the how and the regularity of taking the Lord's Supper. I want you to notice in your Bible a couple of passages with me. Look in Acts chapter 20 and I want you to notice what the New Testament church in the first century did. Remember, we follow the pattern of the New Testament church, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We follow the example of the Scriptures as it relates to things God has left for us to do. And listen to what they did, Acts 20, verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to part the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Here are Paul and Christians gathered together. When are they gathered together? First day of the week. How many weeks have a first day? Well, every first day of the week. And so when we put the idea that they're coming together on the first day of the week, that's the day, with the fact that every week has a first day, there is no specific week in context. Friend, you've got Christians coming together on the first day of the week, every week, to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, let's put this idea together with some of teaching of God about worship and things like that throughout the Bible. Think about this, and I, you'll see the inconsistency here, I believe, that people can understand this kind of language if they desire to. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says on the first day of every week, Christians are to come together to lay by in store, as you've prospered, Paul said, that there be no collections when I come. Now, friend, just about anywhere you go, every Sunday, somebody's going to pass the collection plate. Why is that? Because 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 teaches that. On the first day of the week, Paul says you're to lay by the store so that there be no collections when I come. Friend, do you notice the similarity between 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 and Acts 20, verse 7? Here it is concerning giving, and the Bible says we're to give on the first day of the week. Yet when it comes to the Lord's Supper and Christians came together on the first two of the day of the week to break bread, we say, well, that's so confusing and hard, but when it comes to giving, everybody understands that idea. And the word every is included, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And so the purpose of Christians coming together was to break bread, Acts 20, verse 7. They came together every first day of the week. Therefore, when Christians come together, we ought to break bread every first day of the week. Let me give you a, an Old Testament parallel. Maybe this will help our understanding of this language. In Exodus 20 verse 8, God said, God simply said this, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Now the Jews never had a problem with that. Why? They understood correctly what God meant. Every Sabbath, every Saturday that rolled around, they remembered that, and rightly so. Now think about when God said, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, and think about Acts 20, verse 7. Christians came together on the first day of the week. Oh, that's, so, that's not hard. Every week has a first day, just like the Sabbath. They remembered every Sabbath. We remember the Lord's death every first day of the week. And so it's not the case that God just simply left this up for man to decide without any direction or guidance concerning these things. And so we want to think about this idea as it relates to God helping us to see exactly what He wants us to do and how we should live in, the, in, his, uh, in his church today and the actions we should take. And so, friend, we once again want to emphasize, and I, and I hope you'll listen real carefully to our motive and our intent. Maybe some of the things that, maybe some of the things we've said today are different 
than what you've heard. Maybe they're different than what you believe. Maybe different than what you've been taught. Friend, all we ask is that you compare that doctrine and teaching with the Bible. If the Bible's true, as it always is, if things we're saying today are true, then friend, just simply accept it and obey that. Our motive in saying these things today is not necessarily to anger, not to look down on or anything like that. We, we want you to know this. We want you to know that God loves you deeply. He loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son. Christians and members of the Lord's church, we love you and we're concerned about your soul. And friend, if, if these doctrines about salvation are wrong, and as we've seen, are in clear contradiction with the teaching of the Bible, then, friend, I want you to ask yourself, where does that leave people? Well, my friend, it leaves people in a lost situation. And out of love for people's souls, that's why we say these things. Because we want people to be saved. We want to put the Bible and the Word of God, not manuals or catechisms or doctrines of men out there, we want people to hear the Bible and know what God says one must do to be saved. And so what must you do? Friend, to be saved, you've got to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, uh, verse number 17. Once you've heard that message, you must believe in Jesus as God's Son. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. And yes, while belief is essential, it's not the only thing God says one's got to do to be saved. Jesus said you've also got to repent. Luke 13, verse number 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having repented, I must acknowledge with my mouth Jesus is the Savior. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And yes, my friend, Jesus did say, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. If one does not obey the gospel plan of salvation, one does not understand God's truth and obey that, then friend, that person has yet to be saved. God wants them to. We want them to. But to be saved, I've got to know the truth, and then the truth will make me free. And so we're so glad you've joined us today. We encourage you to get your Bible and check these things. See if they're true. If they are, obey the gospel, obey God, and give God the glory and honor in everything you say and do. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.